Welcome to History of Money. My name is Professor Barth, history professor at Arizona State University. All right, today, lecture eight, we're going to head back to Europe. We're in the high Middle Ages, and we're going to transition into the Renaissance, or as my uh, British colleague next door to my office says, uh, the Renaissance. But we will we will say Renaissance in uh, for this for this class. All right. We've taken a, a brief look at the early to middle part of the medieval period. What have we found so far? Well, we've found intercontinental commercial networks, the Silk Road, seaborne traffic via the Red Sea into the Arabian Sea. Gold is primarily coming from Africa and India. As we'll see today, there's some gold in Eastern Europe as well, but primarily Africa and um, in the second place, India. Silver is scarcer in the medieval period than it will be in later periods. The ratio of silver to gold at this time, it depends on the particular um, century and a particular place, is about nine to one or 10 to one, meaning for, to purchase one ounce of gold, you would need about 10 ounces of silver. A little later, when silver becomes more common, You'll need 15 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. Silver is a bit more expensive in this period than it will be in later periods because it's scarcer. And then uh, lastly, the uh, Chinese, the first to adopt paper money, first the flying cash, and then, um, and then uh, later under a song, Yuan and Ming dynasties, government issued paper money. All right, let's head back to Europe. Remember the Dark Ages, transitioning to the, the middle middle ages where feudalism sets in the barbarian migration settled down uh, well historians call the period between the 11th century starting in the 11th century to the end of the 13th century the high middle ages the high middle ages and this truly was a period a good 300 year long period of great um, advancements and achievements in europe quite a reversal from uh, from the previous periods, previous centuries. And in fact, uh, you know, by 1200, Europe rivals uh, by any metric what uh, the civilizations in the Middle East and in China. Um, quite a, a number of impressive advancements during this period. Um, first of all, population is rising. Uh, with the rise in population, New uh, towns and cities are populated, and in, in general, urbanization increase, increases with the rise in urbanization. Commerce also increases. There are also a number of uh, new inventions and in, um, scientific advancements in Europe during this period. Some of them are borrowed from the Arabs and the Chinese. Uh, the astrolab for example from the arabs paper and uh, 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 from paper and gunpowder from the chinese but the europeans in their own right invent the windmill eyeglasses are invented by the italians in the 1280s scissors a better clock a better water mill improved ships in italy uh, paper manufacturing uh, begins in around 1270, which will be quite important, as you'll see in the second part of this lecture. Gothic architecture is, uh, of course, a, a major feature of this period. There's a, a Gothic cathedral, and you just look at it, absolutely um, stunning form of architecture. I love Garth Gothic architecture personally. There, um, here, of course, is the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris before that a dreadful fire uh, not too long ago. Brought me, to, brought me to tears when I was watching it because I thought the whole structure would completely collapse, but uh, thankfully it didn't. Still pretty tragic, though, because this roof here, which was 900 years old and just all made of oak, I think it was, uh, just completely burned down and as did this spire. The spire dated only to the 19th century, but still obviously a prominent feature of that cathedral. The first universities, uh, University of Paris, Oxford University, 
Cambridge University all arise during this time period. There's a revival in learning. Um, obviously, only the, the well-to-do are attending universities at this time, but as they are in, in, in the Middle East, in Middle Eastern universities as well. But the Europeans sort of, uh, you know, follow after a pattern of the Arabian universities by uh, uh, revisiting classical philosophy, Aristotelian logic. And um, there is a true rediscovery of some of these old works. Philosophy was the, uh, philosophy and theology, which oftentimes went hand in hand, was the top science of the, uh, of the medieval university, a focus on the transcendent. The so-called hard sciences uh, were a bit secondary, um, although there uh, were uh, there was improved knowledge in those areas as well. But these old universities centered on on the transcendent, on the philosophical, and deployed dialectical reasoning and, and again Aristotelian logic in pursuing that. Here's an old uh, text textbook from a medieval student. And uh, no printing press yet, but a spread in books and paper. Back then, uh, books were quite the expensive commodity because they had to be written out, uh, composed by hand. And so, but this also had the effect of making them uh, a bit more uh, aesthetically pleasing, uh, beautiful than uh, than the later printed text. Though, of course, printing press made books available for the masses. All right, as you might have guessed, the money supply in Europe is also increasing during this time period. Now, uh, you may remember when I discussed the English unit of account, the pound. I noted, I noted how the pound was initially a pound of silver, and, and that was true during this period. A pound of silver is a lot, so most of the coins actually that circulated were pennies. This is, was an English penny from the period, or groats. A groat was represented four pennies or four pence. And the old symbol for the penny, the D, of course, harking back to the denarius. Here are some uh, additional coins from the High Middle Ages. This one being the earliest of the group. And on the following slide, you see some gold coins. These are not English. These are the this and the previous slide are a collection of German, French, Spanish. The silver coins on the bottom here are from the 15th century, hence uh, you know the, the more sophisticated design. Really beautiful designs. I noted in lecture seven that my uh, I think in the uh, old world, in the early medieval period, in the ancient world, the uh, probably the uh, most aesthetically or artistically beautiful coins came from India. I think that was true, but in the Middle Ages, Europe is giving, uh, in the high Middle Ages, Europe is giving uh, those coins a run for their money. These are um, quite impressive coins. I'm not a numismaticist, uh, although I respect the work of numismaticists. Um, and uh, I can see why people really get into the study of old coins. There is, uh, there are native silver and gold mines in Europe during this period. Now, uh, if you're a European, uh, working in a mine was not your ideal occupation. Uh, very, very difficult work, um, grueling work actually, and it didn't pay so well. Uh, European mines, gold is coming from what today, uh, the kingdom of Hungary in Transylvania, which today is, uh, Romania. So Eastern Europe, and there are a few gold mines there. They're not extensive. They don't compare to, to the gold mines in India, much less Africa, but they're there. In Central Europe, there's a bit more uh, uh, silver mines. And, and so Bohemia, which today is um, the Czech Republic, Austria, some of the German states, there are some silver mines in uh, those locations. Now, in the... 
toward the end of the 11th century, for about 200 years, Europe was at war with uh, the Islamic Caliphate over the Holy Land, Muslim strongholds in the Holy Land, known as the Crusades. Or Europe, probably more accurately stated, Europe led by the Roman Church was at war against these Muslim strongholds. Um, economic and political reasons were just as important, if not more important, than the uh, religious reasons. Nevertheless, uh, for purposes of our class, these are this is a very significant event in European history because it awakened European demand for Eastern goods and for overseas trade, for trade with the East, for silk, for porcelain ceramics, for spices, for cotton, which was coming primarily from India. All of these, this appetite, this demand is awakened by the exposure to the Eastern Mediterranean during the Crusades, specifically the Levant. And the Levant is the this area right here. And, uh, you know, you think about it, some of the spices, European cuisine without spices, um, you know, it's going to be quite bland. You introduce spices into the equation, and, and there's really no turning back. You're going to want spices if you can afford it. And, uh, and so, especially European elites want trade, and uh, that trade will be fulfilled at first by merchants in Italy, by merchants in Italy. And so for part uh, B of our, uh, of our lecture, we're gonna take a look at the Italian Renaissance and, uh, and the coinage and, and bills of exchange in Renaissance Italy. See you for part B.